Uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to this uh, uh, lecture series again. Uh, so this is the third lecture uh, on topological quantum field theories, uh, uh, and uh, it's by Madhu. Uh, so over to you, Madhu. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, so uh, the last couple of lectures um, we've been talking about uh, TQFTs. Um, oh, the first lecture we talked about uh, some general property properties of cohomological field theories, and last lecture we looked at some uh, geometrical stuff. We looked at uh, fiber bundles and vector bundles. Um, and uh, the consensus was that we should talk a little bit about some physics -y stuff as well, um, or maybe some, a little, some, some stuff with a little more physics flavor. So the, today I'm going to talk about schoen simons theories, a little bit about schoen simons theories and axiomatization. Uh, with both the schoen simons theories and axiomatization of TQFTs, these are very big subjects. Uh, and as you all know, these are uh, subjects that have like a very long um, history and a lot of work has been done. Uh, so uh, of course, I'm not going to be able to cover even, this is really just kind of a, a teaser trailer to the kind of work that has been done. Uh, but um, uh, the other thing is that, you know, my, my focus was originally to, to, to build up to talking about cohomological field theories. Uh, and Chern simons theory is a Schwartz type TQFT. What that means, just let me remind you, uh, what that means is that it's a theory that you can construct that explicitly does not have any dependence on the metric. You don't need the metric to construct the Lagrangian and the path integral. And so it is, uh, it is um, a priori uh, a sort of uh, TQFT in some sense. Um, so my focus will not really be on talking about John Simon's theories, I think that, you know, like we, we have here Orgo and Nitu who have uh, looked at aspects of John Simon's theories on three manifolds. I think they may be good people to, you know, talk about some of the aspects of these theories. Um, and uh, uh, what I would like to do is since Aditya mentioned that, you know, he's interested in talking a little bit about the relation between axiomatic TQFTs and uh, the theory of Frobenius algebras. Uh, uh, what my, my, my plan was, to, my plan today is to build up to a point where Aditya can take over and talk about that, right? And then I can come back in and talk about uh, supersymmetry and stuff. So anyway, uh, I, I guess we'll just see how it goes. So let's begin. Um, uh, the first topic for today will be churn simons theories. So just to get some intuition, uh, let's just start with Maxwell's electrodynamics, right? We're all familiar with this very, very nice theory of uh, electromagnetism and it's given by a Lagrangian, um, a Lagrangian density that's um, uh, f mu nu f mu nu, right? <clears throat> uh, and we all know how to work out the equations of motion, uh, the Bianchi identities uh, and so on. Um, there is however another possibility that you can write down. So uh, you can have, you can, you can of course, you know, have terms like, uh, uh, you can of course have terms like uh, f to the four and so on. Those are like nonlinear modifications of electromagnetism. Uh, but there is another possibility, which which is just quadratic in f, and and that's what's called the theta term. Okay. So the way we construct the uh, theta term, and this is just to sort of get us uh, thinking about John Simon's theories. The way we construct the theta term is to first start by constructing the Hodge dual of the uh, field strength. Right. The Hodge is defined in, in this way. And uh, we can consider the addition of, uh, in addition to the Maxwell term, we can also imagine uh, adding a term S theta, which is um, just uh, this guy over here. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of the electric and magnetic fields, this guy is going to look like uh, E square minus B square, where E and B, roughly E square minus B square, where E and B are the electric and magnetic fields. And this guy over here is roughly going to look like E dot B. Okay. And it is a, it is a standard exercise in uh, introductory electrodynamics to show that uh, the E dot B term, when you add it to the uh, Lagrangian, does not affect the equations of motion, right? And the reason for that is that uh, this density itself uh, uh, or, or, or the, the sort of uh, the part of the, this part of the density is really a total derivative. Uh, this is, I'm just working with U1 gauge theory. Uh, the F mu, F, uh, star F mu, F mu is, is just uh, a total derivative. And this object over here is sometimes referred to as a topological current. Okay. 
So the theta term uh, is topological in the sense that it does not affect the equations of motion. It's a bulk term, right? So when I do an integral over four space-time dimensions, then the total derivative here allows me to uh, throw this term to the boundary. So, so this term is topological in the sense that it doesn't affect uh, the equations of motion and that it only depends on boundary information of the gauge field. Right? The fact that the theta term is, is sensitive to the topology of the gauge field is something that you know we will kind of look at in a little more detail as we as we go along not today but you know hopefully in this uh, series of lectures uh, the important thing to note is that you know we don't we didn't need the metric to write down the theta term we don't need the metric to write down the theta term right? we just use the volume form the epsilon tensor uh, to write down um, the uh, theta term and this is a kind of a cool thing because uh, what that tells you is that if, uh, already we have a hint that you know if there is an object that you don't need the metric to write down, that perhaps uh, you know some Schwartz type uh, PQFT might be related to it. It's just a hint at this point. We'll see how that hint is realized. Okay. Um, uh, Madhu, one question. Uh, yeah. Just a simple. Uh, so you, to start with this f theta, you have written d four x. So it's in four dimensions. Yeah. And after reducing it to the boundary on the 3D boundary, whatever mm -hmm. theory you have, that you call the chance theory. Ah, so I haven't, uh, I haven't, yeah. So, so you'll recognize, of course, that for a U1 gauge theory, right? This is precisely yeah. the form of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Lagrangian for the U1 Chan Simon theory is going to look like this, right? It's going to have an ADA. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, 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 right. But I haven't, I right. haven't yet said anything about Chan Simon theory, right? I'm going to. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going okay, to stick okay. to a four-dimensional perspective and then an n-dimensional perspective, and then I'm going to come back to four dimensions. And, and, yeah. But we'll see, we'll see the John Simon theory and its relation to this object. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, sorry, maybe it's just a bit periodic, but uh, I mean, the way you've written, it looks like it depends on the metric, although it does not, I agree. Uh, hmm. But the way, uh, I mean, uh, it's it's not clear from the way you said you've written that it does not depend on the metric. Because I understand. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So, so what I really should do is I should, uh, and I think I will write this later on. Is that the way that we would write the Maxwell equation, uh, Maxwell action, is to write it in terms of forms in this way. Okay, and the way that I would write this guy over here is f wedge f. Okay. And f wedge f, of course, gives you a top form on a four manifold. And so you can integrate. So sorry, this is this is the this is the notation that is used. Um, I mean, this is I mean, I'm just I'm just writing it at a very loose level at this point. So um, I understand the confusion, but uh, yeah, this this term uh, explicitly depends on the metric, whereas this does not. <clears throat> Good. So um, the thing is, the, the theta term is actually of uh, considerable interest. Uh, theta term is of considerable interest in, in, in a variety of uh, different fields. Uh, for example, you know, one of the one you know, possible modification you can imagine to Maxwell's equations is to, is to add you know, a term like this, right? And strictly speaking, what you can do is you can think of the theta, this, this coefficient, this sort of coupling constant type thing. You can think of that as being um, the expectation value of a field, okay? And then what you can do, uh, the expectation value of a field that takes a particular value, right? It's just, it's, it's frozen onto a particular value. But then what you can do is you can turn on dynamics for this guy as well. And in that situation, what you get is a set of equations which describes what's called axion electrodynamics, okay? So it's just, it's a modification of, uh, of, uh, uh, of um, Maxwell theory. Uh, and and really, it sort of uh, it changes your your your, e your e equations of motion. Your equations of motion now have like this theta as a dynamical field, and so you have like um, a couple of set of differential equations as well. Uh, it's also of interest because um, the theta term features prominently in discussions of um, topological insulators, um, the Hall effect, and so on. So these are these are things that you know one can read about if one is interested. But this is a term that I'm sure all of you have kind of seen before, at least, if not seen in some specific context. So more generally, right, uh, for a gauge field A, let's say this is a, 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 a gauge field, which we will think of as like a, a Lie algebra value one form on a principal G bundle, all of that stuff. I, I'm not using that language right now, but what we can do is we can, uh, we can define the corresponding curvature F 
uh, in terms of this gauge field, this is a non-abelian gauge field, and uh, we can define the covariant derivative in this way. Okay, and in terms of this, the Young-Mills-Lagrangian can be written down like so. Okay, uh, so you know you can think for definiteness. So this this is some uh, this is some uh, this is uh, usually the the, the, the Keeling form on on the the Lie, Lie algebra. And uh, this is a man, this is a four, this is an integral over a four manifold. Uh, and you can see in this form, uh, in this avatar, that it's explicitly metric dependent. Okay. Now, uh, uh, F is a two form, right? Because we started with A, which is a one form. Uh, so F is a two form. And uh, in four dimensions, star F is also a two form. So this, this whole object here is a four form. We can also imagine constructing uh, uh, another four form, like so. You see that this does not require the use of a, a Hodge Hodge dual, and the fact that it does not have it does not require a, a Hodge dual tells us that it's not uh, it does not require a metric to construct, right? And um, more generally, on a on a two n manifold, I can extend this definition, right? And uh, I can write down the action uh, like so. On a two n manifold, uh, I can have just n factors of f, right? And uh, these these integrands are called uh, churn forms. Okay. Um, uh, so so the, the integrands are called churn forms, and uh, these are some things that you know we will see uh, in in the math, uh, the sort of more uh, mathematics related lectures. We'll see them arise naturally as uh, invariants that uh, or sorry the integral of these objects, appropriate integrals of these objects are like. Um, uh, you know, uh, invariants of, 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 of manifolds. So, so uh, we, we, we'll see how that, we'll see how that plays out in uh, future lectures, probably. Excuse me. Yeah. Is there something uh, special about starting with a one form field to do this? Let's say if I start with a two form field, I ha have a three, three form field strength. Right. And mm -hmm. if the space is of dimension of, of the type three N, mm -hmm. Uh, can I still do that? And will that give me something interesting? Or let's say I start with like a scalar field, a mm -hmm. algebra valued scalar field, right. have a one form field strength, right. you know, like D5. Right. And then any uh, space of any dimension I have, I, I can you know, wedge D5 right, n right. times right. and get a top form. Yeah. Uh, is that something worth studying? Does that give something? I would think that in the case of the scalar, like, uh, uh, so basically uh, in the case of the scalar, you know, you, you uh, if you wanted to, let's say, construct an object like this, this M would be like a two manifold, right? Mm -hmm. But two dimensional uh, electrodynamics, uh, I think you, you, you basically just have like a, a scalar, right? That corresponds to the, you can think of it as like a magnetic field piercing the- I'm, Yeah, sure. But, but I'm, no, I'm, I'm saying that it is some the algebra Right. I look scalar field. It's not you. It, it's 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 not just you one. Right. Right. Okay. So it's it's d d phi wedge d phi where phi is a Lie algebra valued scalar field. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I I I haven't actually thought about it. Uh, uh, the, the the case where uh... so I can still have like d, d phi wedge star d phi, which is like the standard d d phi. Right. Team if I and then I, I can have n wedges of d phi. Is that something? Um, I would have to look more carefully. Um, okay. I don't know. But it will be a topological term, right? Like still, you are not introducing the dual in your wedge. Yeah, that is right. Yeah, it will yeah, still be a topological is, term. What I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to. But does that does does that yield something? Why is it not studied as much? Because I we, we have heard a lot about FHF or or the John Simons object, right. but why is it that one doesn't uh, do this for for uh, for uh, fields that are not one form, like not right. starting with a one form field? Right, right, and and we know that you know we have in in in, in string theories we have like higher form. Surely, fields. scalar field seems like a better better thing to. You know, start with than right. a one form field. So there must probably be some explanation. That's what I was asking. Um, if there is, I don't know it. But uh, but uh, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, I'll I'll try and look it up uh, before okay. next time. Thank you.
uh, sorry my internet got disconnected can you can you just repeat the question uh. Uh, um, so uh, so uh, Aditya's question was basically, you know, what is it? Why is it so special that you know we start off with a one form uh, field and then uh, construct, uh, you know, a, a churn forms in, in this way? What if we started off with a Lie algebra valued scalar, or uh, if we started off with a two form uh, and uh, you know constructed a top form in an appropriate fashion? Then you know, is that something that's interesting? If so, why? If not, why not? I guess. So I, I haven't seen, yeah. so I haven't seen uh, anything like that. But uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe if someone else in the audience knows, then they can chip in, or I can look it up before we meet next time. Okay, all right. So I'll 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 I'll, I'll look this up and get back to you. Okay, all right. So, um, so these these integrands uh, are called churn forms, uh, and and I'm going to use the short uh, shorthand uh, trace f to the n to, to refer to uh, an object like this. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to perform some uh, manipulations uh, uh, in order to sort of uh, try and get towards the uh, churn Simons Lagrangian, the churn Simons action. Um, I will use some identities here, which um, which require proving. Or, or which require kind of the appropriate definitions in order to show. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask that you kind of just trust me on this. Uh, and we will see how these manipulations are done, uh, if, if at all, uh, uh, in, in future lectures. So let's consider what the variation of the action is. Okay, if I have like a on an n uh, n manifold, I uh, let's say my action is just this guy, right? Then let's ask what the variation of the action is. Okay. Um, now, uh, what I do here is like I, I push the variation into the trace, and uh, the factor of n here comes from the fact that this variation hits all of these guys. Okay, uh, and uh, once it hits all of these guys, what I'm doing is I'm rearranging uh, the uh, all the terms that appear here uh, so that the delta f sits out in front. Okay, and uh, the fact that f is a two form means that I don't pick up any signs from from this this process, and that's what gives me the factor of n. Okay, this is just uh, you know Leibniz rule basically. Um, the the next thing that I will use is that the, the variation of the field strength is the covariant derivative of the variation of the uh, gauge field. Okay, uh, this is uh, this is an, uh, an easy thing to show, but I won't show it now because I want to show it when we're talking about uh, uh, principal bundles. So for now, just trust me on this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, in, in, in this next step, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to integrate by parts. I'm going to push the, the derivative uh, onto f. Okay, and then what I find is is because of Bianchi's identity, which is just a consequence of the definition of f itself. The Bianchi's identity is given by d f equals zero. I find that the uh, variation. Just, uh, uh, sorry. So in, yeah. in you said that since f is a two form uh, under wedge interchange, you want to cover that. Sorry, Ritu, I can't hear you. Uh, since f is a two form, means the fact that you have uh, a multiplication with n and no relative sign. Right. That is that is because f is a two form. That, that is in the sense that so basically, when 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 this variation jumps over a particular form, then uh -huh. uh, there, uh, the, there is a sign that's picked up that's based on the, right, the okay. you know it's basically that the, that's what I'm using. Okay, okay. Since it's a two form, it, there'll be a double shift. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay. so yeah, it's it's just a it's just a straightforward consequence of that rule for how, how you pass a variation through through a, a sequence of wedge products. Uh, it's okay. I think it's called the graded Leibniz rule or something. So okay. that, it, it just comes from that. Yeah. Okay. So so uh, uh, Bianchi's identity, which is just a consequence of the definition of f, right? Uh, as as the definition of the curvature. Uh, well, what we can use, we can use that to basically tell us that the variation of the action is zero, right? So what we've done is we started off with uh, an action that looked like this guy, right? And then we sent A to like A plus delta A. And what we found was that the action does not change under small variations of the gauge field itself, okay? 
that's uh, that's kind of cool because what this tells us is that we've got a quantity that doesn't really depend on what a is used to compute it in the sense that you can you can take all of the uh, any gauge field within a particular class right and this that class depends on how the gauge field behaves at, uh, at the boundaries of the uh, of the this, in this case an n manifold right and you can pick any gauge field within that class and it's going to give you the same answer does not vary when you vary within the class. Okay. So, so what 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 is happening really is that uh, this object, this churn form, it's break. It's it's almost like it's breaking up the space of gauge fields into inequivalent uh, groups depending on how they behave at infinity. Okay. So, if you have a gauge field that's in in one of these groups and you change it a little bit within the same group, right? Then the evaluation of, of this action, uh, the, the action itself is not going to change because it's not sensitive to movement within this group. So you can imagine the space of gauge fields like this, and then I break it up like so. And if I move around inside one of these boxes, it doesn't matter. Um, sorry, uh, for, what, what is not clear to me is why is this categorization here, at, at least from this whatever derivation you have here? Uh, so, uh, what do you mean? Uh, you said that, what, I mean, from whatever you've written so far in this derivation, what if I change from one class to the other, somehow ah, the action so, is... So this is the thing, changing from, uh, so we'll see why we cannot do that in a moment, but uh, changing from one class to the other essentially corresponds to changing the value of this guy. And what I'm going to show you in, in uh, I mean, what I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, and we'll, we'll prove why this is the case later on, right, is that this object is actually an invariant within a class. Okay. So, so, uh, so what it, uh, what it, uh, it, it's kind of like a winding number in some sense. It, it, it's not, it's not sensitive to small perturbations. I see. Uh, I see, I see. In fact, for, for like, for N equals two, uh, this is precisely the instant on number of the, that labels the gauge field configuration, right? And as long as you vary within the same class, when I say same class, I mean within the same instant on number, which means you don't mess around with the boundary conditions at infinity, mm -hmm. you're going to get the same number. So the action itself does not change. I see. So, okay, okay, I see. I, okay. Uh, just one more thing. So yeah. uh, would, would that mean f to the n, which means f, h, f, h, f, n times, right. is that also exact, like how f, h, f is exact in 4D? Yes. That is correct, and that's 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 what we're going to see that in four D. But we can show that uh, you know you have uh, uh, this this object f to the n is uh, is always the is it's the uh, exterior derivative of uh, and two n minus one form. Two n, and yeah, that two, two, n two n minus one form will then be the churn Simons form. Yeah, the any yeah, odd the analog, dimension. Exactly, the analog of the churn Simons form. So you can have these forms in in in. Um, in three dimensions or dimensions, or dimensions yeah. yeah, three, three, five, seven. Hmm. Okay. Uh, just one, the... Sorry, sorry, one at a time. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Ha, continue. Ah, okay, okay. So, so uh, the that follows from the Bianchi identity, right? Like, so F H F H. How many other times you can just replace one F with uh, uh, D A and uh, then use like a biparts, and because of Bianchi identity, you have a total derivative. That is the logic. But in three dimensions, uh, it is not exactly a wedge f, right? The churn Simon's term is not exactly a wedge f, right? It's, it's, it's not, but uh, you I have understand. a factor of like you have those uh, one third or two third, two third, uh, two third, yeah, yeah. Two third. We, we're going to see that in four dimensions, but but yeah, uh, so I don't think it is, I yeah, I think you can write it. They 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 will be an a wedge f wedge f wedge f part to the whole thing but i don't think it's probably just that because that that is all that is not true in three in 3d itself so i see we'll, we'll it's not see. a vhf it's not a vhf in 3d that's right. what i'm saying mm -hmm. yeah right so yeah we, we'll see what it looks like in four dimensions but i think rito had a question yeah, I think, uh, the last line when you are uh, taking the derivative to this side, uh, typically it is the Hodge dual of the derivative which acts on the uh, wedged part, right? 
So that you are transferring somehow to D again. Back to D. Sorry, you mean you mean the part where I'm moving this guy over here? Right, right, right. right. It's typically the Hodge Hodge of the derivative, right? Because you want it to be act on the appropriate form so that the full thing remains still a top form. Right? Um. No, I think this is correct. Uh, There, there is a version of Leibniz rule for just the D, right? Like D on some, you know, yeah. P wedge Q is just D of P wedge Q plus or my, I mean, minus one to the power something uh, 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 P wedge DQ, right? Yeah, I, I, I have a feeling that's correct. Um, maybe... yeah. No, no, we are taking a problem. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe we can, uh, I, I, I'll, in any case, let, let me, let me just mark this to check. Okay, so uh, so so what what we found is kind of nice. We've seen that the sort of action is is sort of invariant when we when we change the gauge field slightly, right? And um, and uh, 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 what we can also do is we can use, can use using a, the the following property of the trace, which is another thing that we will prove later on. I'm sorry, I'm not proving much today. Uh, but uh, if I if I have a total uh, if I have a covariant derivative inside a trace and I want to like pull it out, then it, it then it just becomes an ordinary exterior derivative. What we can uh, conclude is that uh, the churn form is actually closed. Okay. Um, so uh, in 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 our study of like uh, characteristic classes, when we get there, what we will show is that this object. Uh, uh, for all k, depending on the dimension of the manifold that you're working in, this object actually is an integer. This, uh, this, this, uh, the churn form, uh, the integral of the churn form over the, uh, the in this case, the, the 2k manifold uh, is, is going to be uh, an integer. Uh, and this sort of thing is used, uh, for example, when studying uh, instantons or magnetic monopoles. And in the case of magnetic monopoles, it's kind of cool because the integrality of the, the churn, churn form, the integral of the churn form essentially corresponds to charge quantization, magnetic charge quantization. So this is something that we will see uh, we'll see uh, subsequently. The, the, the I comes due to the fact that uh, the way you wrote down your f is is it d a and then minus i a wedge a? Uh, oh, you're asking about this i? Yes, like uh, is there an i in the way you wrote down f? Uh, no, no. The way I wrote down f was without an i. Um, then I am bit. Confused? How? Let me. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah, I, because yeah, I, one I was looking at multiple references. So. Just write it as f mu nu equal to d mu a nu minus d nu a mu minus i right, right, a right. mu a nu. The yeah. It's, it's essentially a question of whether you choose your gauge field uh, like to be Hermitian or anti-Hermitian, right? That's essentially. Uh, yeah. The difference. So yeah, yeah I I uh, I have to check this. But okay, you can forget about this for a moment. Uh, this object here, modulo some factors, uh, is is always an integer. Okay. okay, this is this is something that we will we we will sort of we will show explicitly that this is the case, or we will at least see explicitly that this is the case when we're constructing um, uh, characteristic classes properly, and uh, when we study what's um, What's called churn wild theory. I think that we can see this over there. So yeah. So uh, are there any questions before I start? Like I, I was thinking of starting to like derive the churn Simons action now from 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 what we have in four dimensions. Are there any questions? Okay. Good. So now uh, let's let's uh, derive the uh, Chern Simons action. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a s to be uh, a small s times a, where uh, s is is a sort of number between zero and one. Okay. Uh, these sort of tricks are very common in uh, the, like the, the the way this derivation proceeds. This this sort of trick is going to become very common increasingly as we go on. Um, but uh, uh, S is going to be uh, value from zero to one. So when S is equal to zero, we just have like uh, the, the gauge field, just trivial gauge field, right? A equals zero. Uh, and when S is one, we have like a non-trivial gauge field. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and use this 
representation of fs right which is which is the the con uh, curvature corresponding to this connection uh, we're going to use that to try and write down uh, trace f square which is a top form in four dimensions uh, in uh, uh, in terms of the chern simons form okay so this is a this is a reasonably simple derivation what we do is we start off by just writing trace f square as uh, you know in this integral representation okay you see that this is just a total derivative so uh, it's uh, i can just do uh, fs uh, uh, this is just uh, this guy at 1 and 0 and then i uh, then just one gives me trace f square because when a when a is uh, zero, uh, f is also zero, so that's that doesn't uh, give you anything. Okay. Now I push the uh, push the derivative inside, right? And uh, the reason uh, the, the, for the factor of two is because this derivative is going to hit both these guys. Okay. And uh, once again, I use the fact that the variation of the uh, variation of the field strength is the covariant derivative of the variation of the Gauge field itself, so that's that's where uh, that's what's happening when I go from this guy to this guy over here. Okay, and uh, DAS by DS is just A, because AS A sub S is just uh, S times A. So I have I have this guy. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to this uh, a term that is like formally zero, right? So I'm going to uh, add, huh? Yeah, uh, shouldn't uh, the d by ds act on the capital D as well because that also has the gauge field in it? Oh no no so 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 the the, the general relation between the the so this is not uh, the the relation is not between f it's it's not between, yeah it's not the relation is this delta f equals d delta a so the variations are already here. Right, but so my under so so the d is actually like the uh, the, the so, usual d plus a wedge of whatever right right. Uh, so now this a wedge that has the subscript s in the no, capital no. D. Uh -huh. So so what I'm saying is that in this relation, delta f equals d delta uh, I see, a. I see, I see. You just treat delta as d by ds. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. So uh, so that, that that comes after after everything is said and done. This is exactly what you get. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so from from this step, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a term that's formally zero. The reason for that is just Bianchi's identity. I just have a df uh, equals zero, right? And now what I can do is I can write this as the exterior derivative acting on a wedge f fs. Okay. And uh, so uh, now I pull the deriv uh, this covariant derivative out. It becomes a, an ordinary derivative because of uh, the, the naturality of the trace. And um, when I perform the integral now, what I get is that it is the trace of a wedge dA plus two thirds uh, a cube, which is the, the form that I'm sure many of you have seen before, the form of the uh, chern simons uh, Lagrangian density. Okay. This, this bit you can check explicitly. And in fact, like the fact that you have a, S square over here is precisely why you get uh, this factor of two thirds. This is something that you can check explicitly. Okay. Uh, so, of course, I'm sure all of you have seen the Chern-Simons uh, uh, Lagrangian form before. It the the fact is that this originally arose in the study of uh, uh, what are called Pontryagin classes, which again we will see later on. Um, but uh, uh, maybe, yeah, uh, I have probably a silly question. So let's say your manifold M, mm -hmm. the initial manifold where your uh, trace F square is defined. So four manifold, yeah. Right. So if that four manifold does not have any boundary, yes. Like, then does it always the action is zero because action is trace F square on the mound uh, on the manifold M, which is yeah. basically exterior derivative of some term, mm -hmm. right? So that means use the, I mean, Stokes. Stokes are, yeah. Right. So then it's only uh, this value evaluator and the boundary. So that's, there is no boundary, then it's always zero. Is it true? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So for any closed manifold, if I just consider some closed manifold, okay, okay, okay good. Okay. I think that's true, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't have a, if you, if, if, yeah, I mean, that, that follows, right? Because if you have a four manifold that doesn't have a boundary, and I can always write mm -hmm. this trace f square as d of something. 
then I right. That's what I was thinking. That is it always true? Like uh, if there is no boundary, for... then yes. Ah, okay. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So uh, the 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 thing about the John Simon's action is that uh, it's I just the... uh, huh. uh, yeah about what I I just asked. Uh, I'm not okay. I I. That would mean that there would be no way of computing what the ancient on number is on, let's say, a four sphere or a four dimensional space that had no boundary, right? Um, that that doesn't seem right. Exactly, that's a, right. Or am I mixing something up here? So, so, the, so, so the thing is, instant on numbers are computed on R four, okay? Or some four dimensional. I mean, I mean, you can okay. start with any four dimensional space, and uh, right. And the way you compute, I don't know, C two on that is like F H F. Right, right. Um, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you how. I mean, I'm I'm not familiar with S four. Uh, in the case of R four, what happens is when you go to the boundary, that gives you an S three at infinity. And the instant on number essentially counts how S3 at infinity wraps around S3 of your, let's say, SU2 group manifold. I see. I see. I see. So if In it terms, is. What is I, the yeah, question? That's a good question? Sorry? Uh, what was the question exactly? The question is, uh, if I have a, a, a four man, uh, like, let's say, let's, let's, just, let's just consider the case of C2, right? Let's just consider the case of F wedge F, right? And now I have a manifold uh, that does not have a boundary. So DM is zero. Okay. Uh, in a situation like this, uh, is the, uh, is the, um, the action contribution uh, or trace F square, is that always identically zero? Oh. <clears throat> yeah, I think what you said makes sense. I suppose that's it. But that, that will only depend on whether A vanishes at infinity, right? Means if A doesn't vanish at infinity. No, A but but, uh, but, uh, but Rito, if if I if I uh, if I do this, right? So so basically, I have um, uh, over a four manifold, I have uh, some uh, some omega, right? And I can write yeah. this as integral over a four manifold of d of eta, and then yeah. I can write this as a boundary of the four manifold. Uh, eta. Oh, but if d d four is zero, sorry, not d four. Like uh, if if the boundary is zero, then this is zero, right? Yeah, typically you uh, find that. But wouldn't like uh, like means like, what I what I was getting at that uh, like uh, we know that uh, for. Uh, Say any scalar solution or vector solution, you have one normalizable mode and one non normalizable mode, right? For normalizable mode, what you pretend that I would explain that it will, if there's no boundary, it will just vanish the integral. Uh -huh. Does the same happen for non normalizable mode? But probably I'm mixing up something, but you know. that's different, right? That's a question of the behavior of the, the, the solution as you go to the boundary. Okay. Uh, in the case of like when you have like instantons or something, it's not like the gauge field is blowing up at infinity. It's just that the gauge field goes to some specific value that is not continuously okay, okay. connected to the identity element in the group. Okay, okay. Also, you can uh, fix, the, I, I mean, you also have gauge uh, freedom and you can use that to make sure that the fall off rule for, uh, for your A field is such that you get a finite answer if you, if you do the integral at yes. infinity. Right. So okay, okay, okay. there is a way to pick a a mu that does the job for you. Yeah, I so think the resolution. That... What you said is R four going to extreme. That's the resolution. Yeah, that, that is in the case of R four. But let's say let's say I. So the thing is that I think I guess where the question is coming from is the following. I can think of um, I can think of um, I can I can work on R four. Or what I can do is I can work on S four with a uh, with a with a large radius, right? Uh, S four R goes to infinity, something like that. Okay. I'm I'm essentially thinking about a compactification 
I, I want I want to uh, eventually I want to do physics on R four, but then like the uh, physics on R four is hard, so I'm thinking. Okay, of, okay, okay. So, yeah, in in a situation like this, how does one? I don't know to be honest. Like, uh, but Aditya, you have worked on um, you have worked on. Uh, should I not do this? I, I do it. Do it. <laughs> do it. Yeah, I, I thought that you have worked on uh, localization on on uh, on compact uh, spaces. No. Yeah. So what right. happens there? Yeah. So uh, so what happens there? Uh, is is my mic fine? Can, can, it's can fine. It's fine. I'm, just, yeah, I'm, it I'm embarrassed at what I'm saying <laughs> to you. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, so so yeah. So so the, the, there, what ha happens is that if, if you're studying S four, let's mm -hmm. say S four squash or not squash, it's not important. Uh, you find uh, and if if you're studying super symmetry. On this uh, squashed S4, uh, you will introduce uh, certain, you know, spinners and certain background right. SU to R fields. Right. Uh, they will be such that, such that at the north and south of the sphere, locally it is going to look like the omega uh, deformed R4. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which means you will have in, 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 you 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 will have ancient tons. Which are sub supported at just the North Pole and just the South Pole. I see. Yeah, so uh, so that's what happens I see. Uh, in in all those four dimensional spaces where you uh, have uh, fixed supersymmetry on those uh, spaces. Okay. So I, I I think what you are saying is compatible with that because that is something else because you know something more is ha happening there. You have an omega. Deformed space, right. essentially, right uh, around the north and south of the sphere. So, so, so basically, I mean, the integral will localize onto the poles, right? Uh, path integral, yes. and and at yes. the poles, it's basically going to look like your uh, R four deformed R four problem. Yeah. So, so, so you you will exactly get the necros of partition function due yes. to the fact that you have ancient ons that are. At, at the North Pole and at the South. Which, so it's like, yeah, so the way you compute. Uh, right, right, okay, yeah. okay, all right. The same cool. kind of thing is gonna happen. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so uh, in case you, you did not uh, follow that, uh, it's fine. Uh, you're not missing out on much. Um, uh, the, 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 the question was basically, what happens when you have a manifold without a boundary? And I think the usual, uh, uh, result that uh, that comes from Stokes theorem uh, applies. So I, I think we need to worry about that. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so, so yeah. just, if if a is singular at a point, then uh, 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 then you could still have contribution even in a manifold without boundary. If a it's like a is, punctured sphere in some sense. Like, uh, can I think of it like that? If a is singular at a point on this S four. So Stokes theorem is, I mean, as long as the form is smooth everywhere, fine. Uh, it's, a bound, it's a boundary of a boundary, so it's zero. Right. Uh, but if it's singular, then can I just think of it as like, I, I mean, I'll have to remove that point or something, right? Well, I mean, make it you know, then, then yeah. it's like. So, I mean, I think the, 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 the point is really that uh, the, the question is really what boundary conditions do the gauge field satisfy, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at a, a charge, just a single charge, the gauge field blows up near the charge. Mm -hmm. So whenever we talk about the gauge field configuration, we remove that point from the manifold and we talk about it outside. We can regulate mm -hmm. it in some way. So really, this has a lot to do with what the gauge field is doing all the way at infinity. Right, but on a manifold without boundary, there is no infinity, right? I mean, they, all points are... Yeah, yeah, the if, if, yeah if, there's no, if there's no... I would think that if... I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I would think that... I mean, it's a pathological case, so we could move on, but it's, right. it's a... if I remove a point, then isn't the boundary? Uh, it's just R four. It, it just becomes R four, right? Uh, because R four with one point is is, is four. I would have uh, imagined. Um, uh, I don't. I don't have anything intelligent to say. I'm sorry. Go deal with your pathologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 
sorry. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I'll think about it, but I don't have anything intelligent to say. So, uh, the, so the, 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 the thing about the churn Simons action is that it arises naturally as a boundary term when studying the churn form. Okay, so, so let's say, uh, for example, I'm looking at a, uh, a four manifold M, which is like a unit interval times some, uh, you know, nice oriented three manifold. Okay. Then what I can do is I can show that, uh, so, so the thing is that since I, since I have a product kind of structure, I have sort of natural boundaries at zero and one, right? And you can see that the, the, uh, the churn form itself reduces to the, the difference of the churn Simons actions uh, uh, at uh, zero and one. Essentially, uh, sorry. What's the x and t? Yeah, here? yeah. So I'm I'm telling you what's happening here. So so this is a this is an integral over the entire four manifold. Okay, and what I've done is I have broken up the uh, derivatives into the time and the spatial kind of uh, derivatives. Okay, so and and a t just refers to uh, 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 the gauge field at a particular time slice. So you can think of think of zero comma one as like a, a time interval. And I have a three manifold associated to each point. Okay. And AT is the gauge field configuration on this three manifold. And DX is the exterior derivative on the three manifold. Okay. Not in time. It's just on the three manifold. So uh, if I, if I think of, if I think of my problem like this, then we see that the churn form itself just reduces to uh, two boundary contributions coming from the zero and the one. So these 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 objects sort of arise naturally uh, as boundary terms when studying the churn form. Uh, can you explain that again? I didn't follow. Sorry. So so I so uh, the churn form is defined on a four manifold, right? It's a top form on a four manifold. So uh, what okay. I'm going to do is I'm going to take my four manifold to be zero comma one, which is a unit interval mm -hmm. times some x. X is some three manifold. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can take it to be a sphere if you want. Um, the uh, then what I do is I, uh, I, I, I write this integral over, uh, over uh, uh, M. What I do is I, I write it as uh, an integral of the churn Simons uh, form uh, over X uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, between zero and one. Okay. Ah, okay. okay. I'm okay. basically breaking up the, the so, so this, this F over here has a D, which is the four dimensional uh, uh, like exterior derivative, exterior derivative right. in four, four dimensions. Now there is mm -hmm. one that moves along time and there is another that moves along space, right? So I'm right. just breaking it up into those guys. And what I can show is that uh, this takes a little bit of work. I can show that it's just the difference of the churn Simons actions at the boundaries. So, so, so uh, the zero one is the time? Zero one is the time, that's right. Uh -huh. This is okay. like the, okay. the time. time. Uh, okay, okay. And so originally, the interest in 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 in, in the churn Simons uh, form is that uh, it sort of arises naturally in the context of when you study manifolds with boundaries. Um, but then, of course, physicists came along and said, you know, if we take SCS of A, right, which is what we saw earlier, it's just this guy, to define the action of a quantum field theory on a three manifold, then you get what is called churn Simons theory. So, Rito, this is uh, where we sort of say that like we have a churn Simons theory. It's just a theory of a gauge field. Uh, on some three manifold with uh, uh, a Lagrangian density given by something like this. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Now, uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. One thing. How important is that uh, M should have that product structure? I don't think it's that important. Uh, I'm just, I just did this because this is an easy case. Uh, my guess is that, I mean, I guess if you were a mathematician, you'd be able to show this in some generality as well. So, so would it so would it also be that if if the four that, that if the four dimensional space went from some space x one to x two, mm. I would get like John Simon's action for x one minus John yeah, Simon's. Yeah, so. I think so. I think so. I think so. Yes. I think so. Although I'm I'm not sure. Uh, we should look that up. Okay. So 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 that also means that if I flip the orient. Of the space, hmm. uh, the sign of the John Simon's action will flip as well. Uh, yes. Right? Wouldn't it? Seems so. Right. right. Yeah. Because I have this sense of that, that some space is an in space and some space is an, out, an out space. space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
and of course if if i flip them then then i i should get yes uh, a, a, i should have a sign change yeah uh, okay, okay. Uh, this this when you said you have a transformation set x1 and you have a transformation set x2 uh, and since we are only looking at uh, like the manifold properties the topological properties are they like the same space unless you have a, some uh, topology changing process or something which uh, is is that common um, but you have the field a also so it's it's, a, it's still a function of the field a it is just that it is independent of the g mu nu that you might have that's all that right. means but you, you i mean it's still a function of what the gauge field itself right, right, on right. the space is at right. the two ends it depends on the gauge field yes but but the space itself i thought that's what you meant maybe i misunderstood so uh uh, what do you mean by the space itself? Like uh, the you mean the X guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that's what he meant. That's so, so the meant. thing is that, like you know, the 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 difference between these two guys, right, is is not necessarily uh, zero. It can be proportional. I mean, one can work this out. It can be proportional to some like eight pi square times an integer or something. And uh, that is basically the statement that you're changing your gauge class. Uh, uh, you know, you can these these kinds of things can happen as well. So, I see. So, so can I understand this physically, like from the bulk perspective? Is this like the gauge field uh, as you evolve in time? Hmm. Uh, it, it is somehow. Uh, uh, I mean, through time evolution, it is going from one class to the other. Is is that is that correct? Um, yeah, to be perfectly honest, I don't know how to think about like a physical process that would do this for you, but uh, I can certainly imagine having, uh, you know, gauge field configuration. It's like an initial configuration and a final configuration, and I can. It's 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 kind of like in quantum mechanics, right? You know, you have an initial configuration, a final configuration, and then you ask what is the probability of going from one to the other. Mm -hmm. There'll be some probability, right? Now, okay. yeah, I I, I I think that. I think physically, like if you are changing the class of the gauge field, that would mm -hmm. essentially correspond to some kind of tunneling from like a zero, from like a, let's say a zero instant on vacuum to a one instant on vacuum or something. I see. I you see. know that we know that instant ons really correspond to, you know, tunneling right. solutions in, in gauge theories. So, right, right, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Yeah, we we will we'll, we'll see these sort of things like in, in maybe more mathematical detail um, uh, so as to provide sufficient amount of intuition at some point. Uh, and, and of course, when we talk about like this, we'll talk about examples also, of like let's say instant on solutions and stuff like that. So we will get a sense of what's going on there as well. So, uh, John Simon's theories are, of course, uh, interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, you know, the, not typically not in and of themselves, because um, uh, well, in and of themselves also, you, they're, they're very interesting. There's classic work by you know Witten. Uh, he won the Fields Medal for it. It's uh, it involves uh, the relation between John Simon's theory and and sort of using John Simon's theory to give an intrinsically three dimensional definition of uh, knot invariants, uh, a large class of knot invariants. Uh, but also when you study uh, Chern Simon's theories with matter, there are a lot of interesting dualities uh, that are conjectured uh, between uh, bosonic and fermionic theories and so on. So uh, these, uh, these theories are of considerable interest to, to physicists. Uh, and like I said, you know, the, 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 the sheer amount of content uh, that uh, is related to these theories is, is, uh, is, is staggering. Um, so I, I, I don't think I will be talking much about John Simon's theories in any case, but uh, you know, if you're interested, I, I, I know of some good places to start looking. So just you know, message me on the, on, um, the Slack. We're not using Slack now, what are we using? Discord, Discord. Discord. Huh. You message me on the Discord and I, I, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send you some good references for it. Um, but what I want to do is I want to use this as a sort of launch pad to discuss uh, the axiomatization of, uh, TQFTs. So, if there are any questions about the John Simon stuff, or if you guys want to have a short discussion about John Simon's related stuff, um, this would be a good point. Yeah. 
Madhu, just to just to uh, confirm, so so this uh, trace f square. Uh, I mean, you are not thinking about the f with star f that term, right? The no, 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 just... absolutely not. No, no. This this is just f. This is just f wedge f. That's the right. So is is there any way like if you start with some Young Mills theory on some manifold, let's say that kind of m zero one cross x, does uh, it have any connection directly with chance ones? I mean, no, on... no, no. Oh, okay. No, it doesn't because so the thing is that uh, young Mills theory when you write down the lagrangian that it explicitly involves the metric and we know that this is a dynamical theory in the sense that right. we know that this has local excitations you know when we quantize the theory we know that you know it has photons or gluons or something so uh, we know that um, this theory is not like um, it's not like all the dynamics sit in the boundary or something like that essentially so mm -hmm. with with young Mills theory there are no you don't get any simplifications essentially but but right. in the case of in the case of these topological terms so mm -hmm. the, now for example you can have your usual young mills theory and you can have this term in addition to that right, right? Mm -hmm. and that has certain effects right you can consider coupling a, 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 a sort of um a, a, or you can for example if not working in four dimensions if you are working in three dimensions you can consider coupling a chern simons theory to uh, some matter, some kind of matter, bosonic, fermionic matter. Right? Mm -hmm. You can study mm -hmm. that, but but right. just Young Mills in and of itself, uh, there are really no simplifications on on. on. I, I'm not actually asking about that. Chan Simons plus I mean sorry, Young Mills plus this term. I mean, if we oh, started. Okay. 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 So yeah. So uh, uh, Young Mills plus um, Young Mills plus um, uh, Chern Simons terms. Uh, they essentially have, uh, yeah, the, the, the what's it called? The um, the theta term, essentially the addition of the theta term, whether you're in an abelian or a non-abelian gauge theory, makes certain changes to your um, your physics. Uh, in in the case of, um, uh, well, in the in the four dimensions, I, I, four dimensions, I, I don't know it offhand, but for example, in three dimensions, it's kind of interesting. If you had a chern simons theory. Right, mm -hmm. and you couple it to some kind of matter, then the effect of the Chern Simons term is is really to sort of pin uh, magnetic fluxes onto the, the excitations of the right. particles. And so that that right. kind of gives that, that changes the dynamics considerably. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in the case of the in the case of the, the addition of the theta term, uh, it's not going to the, of course, the, the bulk bulk dynamics will not change. The equations of motions don't change, but then, like you can have sort of effects related to the topology of gauge fields that can right. that can arise. Mm -hmm. uh, when when you mean uh, the theta term in three D, uh, do you mean the? Uh, uh, I mean, what what is the theta term in three D? No, no, I didn't say theta term in three D. I said Chern Simons term in three D. Ah, oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. If I write Chern Simons theory and then I couple that to matter, so let's say I minimally couple that to some kind of scalar field or something like that. Then the quanta of the scalar field now uh, uh, they they kind of behave like they, they sort of carry flux around with them magnetic flux around. Them. I see, I see. There is a very nice like maybe I can just tell you some some references now. There's a very nice uh, old review of uh, Chern Simons theories uh, by Gerald Dunn. Uh, I think you can find it on. I think it's on the archive. Uh, it's a very very nice very readable review. Uh, and of course, if, if you're looking for something a little more hardcore, uh, there is uh, Greg Moore uh, taught at, uh, I think, one of the recent TASI lectures, uh, at the, one of the recent TASI really schools. Yeah. Ah, and, and, and he has, he, of course, you know, Greg Moore, like when, when he prepares for a course, there's like 400 pages of notes, you know, so like, but all of these things are available on his web page. So the, he has a set of lecture notes on Chern Simons theories. So you can take a look there as well. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, I I uh, I just want to get a sense of like is uh, is everyone reasonably? I, I understand that this is a very short discussion of Chern Simons theory, uh, but uh, but you know, uh, yeah, maybe we can do better uh, as time goes by. Okay. Uh, so let's let's uh, let's consider a three manifold M. Okay. Here from now on, I'm I'm just going to be working with I'm mostly going to be working with three manifolds. Uh, let's consider a three manifold M, which is like sigma cross uh, a unit interval. Okay. And uh, uh, like intuitively, so and sigma over here is like a two manifold. So it's like a Riemann surface, basically. 
right? So intuitively, uh, for every uh, t in uh, zero comma one in the unit interval, the, the the space on which the physics is happening, we can think of this as like the time coordinate. A physical space on which the physics is happening is just some uh, some Riemann surface, okay? Uh, the the and so for example, this this here is is an example of uh, well, it's in in illustration of this. The point is that we don't really have a unique way to slice uh, time uh, in 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 such a surface, okay? So let's say that I have like a manifold M, uh, and uh, you know this the. Well, the boundaries of M are just this, this, this uh, are just two circles here, and then the the uh, uh, there's another boundary uh, sigma sigma one, which I'm going to call this guy, and the two circles over here are uh, sigma zero. Then the, the fact is that I don't have like a natural way to slice time, um, but one way I can do this is I can I can define these things called Morse functions, uh, and uh, Morse functions essentially take the, the entire three manifold. To a value uh, to a to to the unit interval in such a way that the inverse image of zero uh, is uh, the the manifold that you start off with at uh, t equals zero, and the 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 inverse of the pre image of uh, of one is uh, sigma one or the manifold that you end up with. Okay. Um, now, given uh, given uh, the action we have, we have defined the Chern Simons action. We can define a partition function. Uh, okay, okay, quick, quick question. Uh, so, sigma zero and sigma bar zero are different. Yes, uh, the the bar, the significance of the bar will become clear, but the bar essentially has to do with the orientation. So, uh, uh, the by when I say bar, I really I I, I mean to refer to the fact that uh, this is either an incoming or an outgoing uh, boundary. Uh, we'll 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 see more of this later on. Uh, I'll make this clear. Uh, but for now, you can ignore it. Um, so. Given an action like this, uh, so we, we, we already defined the John Simons action, right? And given an action, I can always write down a path integral like this. Right? Excuse me. So if I understand right, uh, you are not starting with M a of the form uh, X into zero one. I mean, you are just starting with some space M, which has two boundaries, right? Yes. You are no longer sticking to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. At, at, at this point, yes, uh, I'm, I'm sort of doing that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what I mean is that now that I have a John Simons form, right? I have a John Simons, and I've realized that I can sort of use this to define a theory. I can always formally write down a path integral. Okay. So let's let's look at what 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 such an object means. Okay. Um, the uh, the um, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to write a da. Over here uh, is the measure. This is the path integral measure over field configurations. Now the gauge field is the dynamical object here. So path integral is is an is an is an integral that runs over gauge field configurations such that at the boundary sigma i, where i is zero or one, we have gauge field configurations phi i and uh, phi zero and phi one. Okay, so uh, this when when I write it down like this, the the right hand side. You can really think of it as like a Feynman amplitude, right? I start off with a particular gauge field configuration at t equals zero. I end up with a gauge field configuration at t equals one. And now uh, the path integral, uh, when I compute it with these boundary conditions, the path integral really computes for me the transition amplitude to go from this configuration to this configuration under time evolution, right? That's what the, the, the Feynman path integral computes for us. But so the space that, is also not the same now. The underlying space at the two ends is not the same. I mean, that is also part of the in state and out state in, in input, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of specifying that, like, you know, I have specific boundaries of a specific form. Hmm. Right. So uh, now I, uh, uh, and that's why, uh, that's why I've written it, uh, written down the left hand side uh, in this fashion, right? I'm really thinking of it as, a transition amplitude between some state phi zero and some state phi one. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I'm getting ahead, but uh, uh, I the way your notation for me it sort of suggested that you're like you're using this uh, uh, zero one as your like sort of a base space, and the t is your uh, uh, projection, and your sigmas are uh, fibers or something. Is that not? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not uh, drawing on any. Uh, fiber bundle related stuff. I here. see. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, the the uh, I'm I'm really just thinking about it in terms of like just the quantum mechanics uh, and 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 sort of uh, the uh, transition amplitudes in the Feynman uh, picture. Okay. 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 Uh, one condition. Um, sorry, one question. Yeah. So when you're talking about the field configuration of phi zero and phi one, yeah, these are gauge field configurations, right? So yes, the gauge gauge condition that you are fixing, the gauge fixing condition is like same for both. Or is there a notion of because to get a field configuration, you first have to fix a gauge, right? Or, um, because your action is gauge invariant, you right. Well, well, my my action is my action is 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 gauge. Well, it's almost gauge invariant, right? right? Um, if there is, there it's is up a, to boundary terms. You are saying that's almost thing up to boundary terms. No, in the sense that like the the action itself can uh, it, it, there is a periodicity associated to the to, to the coefficient in the action. Um, I have not uh, mentioned that specifically yet, but I I I want to sort of. Um, the way I'm thinking about it right now is is really very loosely. Let's not uh, think so much about um, maybe let's not let's try and not think too much about like gauge fixing conditions and other technicalities, right? I just want to give you an intuition for how uh, I want to introduce the axiomatization. Uh, can I ask a question on the path integral itself? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, this is related to what uh, uh, Aditya was also saying is that so the action itself I'm computing on a particular base space. Okay. Uh, 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 sorry, not basis. A particular space X. Yeah. Or uh, uh, sigma here, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, usually when we do the path integral, that space is fixed, and then you're only evolving the gauge fields on that space. Right. Uh, but here, uh, from what I just said, it's it, it seems like phi zero and phi one. I mean, the the, the spaces itself is changing. So, uh, how how does how do I understand the path integral then? Um. It's. Uh... <laughs> How do I understand the path? It's it's really just thinking about it as um, okay. So so if if we just sort of zoom out right for a second, what is the path integral doing? The path integral is a map from one one hill one one let's say Hilbert space to another Hilbert space, mm -hmm. right? The Hilbert space at time t equals zero to the Hilbert space at time t equals one. Mm -hmm. So formally, like if I any linear map that does this job, I can think of as a path integral. That's really what's happening here. Right. So, so what you're saying is that I take the left-hand side seriously, but the right-hand side, uh, I mean, you've written it like as a formal uh, thing, but uh, the question about how to actually compute this, uh, that, that is where the uh, subtlety is. I mean. Ah, yes, uh, yes, that's right. Um, how to actually compute this, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, but right now, we are not so much thinking about, uh, so in this process of axiomatization, we're not so much thinking about how to specifically compute things. What we're trying to get at is some essential features that we can turn into axioms that we want to define a topological quantum field. I see. Okay. Okay. So now I can reframe frame the question I was asking a mm. little bit better. So uh, from phi, so you are thinking of this as a transition amplitude from phi zero to phi one, right? Right. Now why I ask the gauge fixing thing is that is there any uh, gauge fixing term you can add to phi zero to make it phi one? Is there a freedom like that? Is that what I was all asking? Um, because if it if it could be like uh, if you if you could go from phi zero to phi one just by a gauge transformation, right? Then then this amplitude wouldn't give you something physical, right? Or wouldn't give something. Physical. Right, right. Of course. So so right. Uh, yeah. I mean, you're basically saying that if if phi zero and phi one are basically within the same gauge class. Uh, right, I mean, right, right, are there right, right, small, right. small, small, small gauge transformations? They differ by small gauge transformations. Then, like this amplitude itself doesn't seem to be. Yeah, uh, I understand. Um, uh, I'm not thinking. Let's not let's not bring up pathological cases like this. Uh, I, I like when when I say that I have like a, a transition amplitude. Let's assume that I'm looking at a non-trivial transition amplitude. Like. Um, Uh, Madhu, <clears throat> Madhu, what is the form of the action? So initially you have this, uh, the space is your zero one cross sigma, right? So as you're starting with the chan Simmons action, this right. S. Right. And uh, now when you are writing it like this in DA integration or this path uh -huh. integral form, right. then are you A's are uh, on defined only on the sigma, right? So it's just uh, on the 2D, I mean the no. surface, the Riemann surface, this case. No no no. no, 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 no. So, 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 so the, so, uh, 
so over here so the, 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 when i when i had this uh, breakup that was only mm -hmm. to illustrate the fact that i don't really have a unique way to break up time right right yes at this point i'm just working with the full m so the s ah. here is just a, 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 a s john simons ah okay 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 this is a particle on the full three manifold with right. the, with these these sort of um, with these sort okay. of okay. at the boundaries of the three manifold these are the gate field values okay and I'm thinking of this as like time evolution. That's really what's right. happening. Right. Okay. okay. Sorry. Uh, hopefully, like if, if you let me proceed, then like I think that over time it will become clear what 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 is what is happening here. So uh, we can think of uh, ZM uh, as a mapping of. So I, I'm defining it like this. ZM I'm defining like this as mapping a field configuration on sigma zero and a field configuration on sigma one to the complex numbers. Right, because it's it's basically taking a bra and a ket and it's taking an inner product. Or alternatively, I can think of it as mapping a field on sigma zero to a field on sigma one. Okay. Now uh, the the other thing about the, the path integral that's kind of nice is let's imagine we have another three manifold n whose boundaries uh, whose boundary is sigma one bar union sigma two. Okay. Now this is where the bar kind of becomes important. So the boundary in the case of the first guy was dm is sigma uh, 0 uh, union sigma 1 bar okay and um, uh, sigma 1 bar union sigma 2 basically means sigma 1 with a particular orientation okay so and and in this case i have a, a morse function uh, t tilde which goes from n to uh, 1 uh, 1 comma 2 which is the unit interval from 1 to 2 uh, then what we can do is since M and N share a common boundary, uh, we can glue the two manifolds M and N at the boundary, okay? And I can compute a, a, a sort of path integral like this. Uh, if I have Z of M union, uh, M union N, when, when I write union subscript sigma one, I mean I'm gluing M and N along sigma one, okay? Uh, and I can have the transition amplitude from phi zero to phi two, uh, defined in, in in this way, which is the, the earlier definition. But then what I can do is I can break that up into this object, right? Where I have a transition amplitude from phi zero to phi one, and then a transition amplitude from phi one to phi two, along with an integral over phi one, okay? And I, I sort of write this down in, in a more evocative form like this. And now it sort of makes it look like this is just an insertion of identity, right? And, and this just gives me uh, phi two, uh, so, so basically the composition of Zn and Zm, okay? So what I'm trying to get at is that um, the, the, the Mars function itself picks out spatial slices, uh, sigma t, and motivated by the path integral, what we want to do is we want to associate a space of states to each slice, each time slice. Okay, so each, uh, so when, when I slice my uh, three manifold, right, I get a two manifold at a particular time, I want to associate a space of states to, uh, to uh, each two manifold. Okay, and then time evolution is going to be a linear map from one space of states to another space of states. And the gluing, uh, the gluing of manifolds will correspond to the composition of these maps. Okay, as we have just seen in, in this example over here. So, uh, yeah, so uh, are there any questions at this point? Is this function t some uniquely defined function? Or? Sorry, I can't hear you. So, this function t, t, yes. Is this some uniquely defined function? Or it's not, right? No, you can pick. You can pick a. You can pick any choice of uh, Morse function. You and I might choose different uh, functions corresponding to different ways of slicing up the the, the times. Okay. So you can see, for example, already that we may not agree on what happens at a particular time because your time and my time are different. Yeah. But both of us, if if we start off with the same initial initial boundary and final boundary, then we will both agree on the transition amplitude. It doesn't matter how you cut it up, basically. Can you say why do you need sigma one bar instead of sigma one? Ah, okay. So there, here, what I mean is just I, I'm just 
assigning to uh, each boundary an orientation. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because, so basically when I say orientation, what I mean is an uh, in or out, okay? So for example, let's say I have a circle here and a circle here, right? And uh, to this circle, I associate uh, in, and to this circle, I associate an out, right? Then if I have another another pair like this, I can just glue the two together yeah. because I'm gluing an in and an out. And that gluing of an in and an out really corresponds to doing something like this. Okay. Right? So it's a, it's, it's a sort of picture. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of physical picture for, for, a, for a mathematical form. Okay. So that's really the significance of the in and out. We'll see, we'll see that once we start writing down things a little more. Uh, Madhu, one more question. Yeah. What is the property of this Morse function? I mean, is it any arbitrarily defined function that has to satisfy its boundary conditions or some well-defined next conditions? Uh, uh, I don't want to get into that right now. Um, Morse functions, the, there are there's certain requirements that you have of Morse function. I don't want to get into that oh, right okay. now. I'm just calling, let's just call them Morse functions for now. Okay. There are some nice functions that you can use to tell time. Just think okay. about it. Okay. It will not be important for, for, for where we are going. Right okay. now. Okay. Uh, so from whatever you just said, the sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, all these things, they have the same topology. So I, I think then the path integral makes sense. I mean, the, the, there's nothing to worry. I think. Sorry, what do you mean? Uh, can you say uh, it again? Because your, your M is a sigma cross uh, zero comma one, mm. right? So then um, sigma at zero and sigma at one, I mean, it's the same sigma topologically. You cannot have uh, the topology of the sigma, I mean, of, of the two manifold right. uh, 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 at zero and at one has to be the same. Well, I mean, it can change, right? Uh, uh, but then it will spoil that product, right? Because it will not be of the form that you wrote above. It cannot be sigma times zero comma one. Yeah, so oh, yeah, yeah. Said that he is no but I said, that so yeah. So when, when, I, when I started this part, sorry, I'm sorry about this, my fault. When I no, started no, but this. It, I agree, I, you, you mentioned this, but if you go down, uh, 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 you when you write this uh, composition of uh, 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 of these uh, uh, functions, yeah. So yes. here your uh, sigma one and sigma two. This sigma is actually, I mean, the m is actually sigma cross uh, uh, zero comma one or oh here no, you no, have no. a Morse function. Ah, I see, I see, I see. I no, see this here. I'm just specifying what the boundary of n is, I and see, I have I a Morse see. function. I see. I understand. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll work out some examples. They're very trivial examples, but they're examples. I see, I see. Okay, if there are no other questions, then, then I'm going to start using words like cobordism now. Uh, this, this is generally when things go south. Um, but what I want you to think of, there's a formal definition, but how I want you to think about this is, think about it as a manifold M with an incoming and an outgoing boundary. Okay, so I just have some three manifold, let's say, let's say, it doesn't have to be a three manifold. It can be any any dimensional manifold, but it, there has to be there have to be two boundaries. There is an incoming boundary and an outgoing boundary, and all the stuff that fills it in between is is what is called a cobordism. Okay, and I have another rule, which is that two cobordisms uh, uh, are equivalent if the two manifolds are diffeomorphic relative to their boundary. What what I mean by that is I keep the boundaries fixed, right, and then I I fill in the stuff in between with uh, you know, uh, whatever dimension manifold I, I, I want, okay? And if the two, if the two, if any two ways of filling up the stuff in between are diffeomorphic to each other, then they are the same. I'm going to consider this equivalence class of, of cobordisms, okay? So, so it's here, just, I'm just drawing a picture, right? Um, here I have like uh, two, two circles as my inner boundary, right? and uh, two circles again as my outer boundary, okay? And you see that what I'm doing is I'm filling it up with uh, this. Uh, so, so the boundaries are one dimensional, right? They're just a, a product of circles. And I'm filling up the stuff in between with a genus one, uh, genus one, uh, this thing, uh, two manifold, okay? Now, what I can, what, what this statement means, the, the equivalence of cobordism is, is that if I pick any genus one, uh, uh, you know, filling, right? Uh, that is diffeomorphic. Uh, any, any genus one filling, basically, uh, I, I'm looking at the same equivalence class. Okay. Any way of filling the space in between these two guys uh, that is diffeomorphic, 
uh, I'm going to treat them as the same. I'm going to treat these two as equivalent. And we'll see why. We'll see why. Now. So the last five minutes, let's define what a topological quantum field theory is. Like, is it the last five minutes? I think so. Um, so uh, an n-dimensional topological quantum field theory Z is a function that assigns to every closed oriented n minus one manifold sigma a vector space. Okay, so to I start off with uh, 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 and uh, uh, and I, I want to define an n-dimensional TQFT. So uh, my n-dimensional uh, my uh, your what I how how I build that up is I start off with my n minus one dimensional. Uh, uh, to, uh, that assigns to every n minus one dimensional manifold sigma a vector space th that I will refer to as Z of sigma, and to every oriented n manifold M such that uh, del M is uh, is is the, is the is the sort of uh, inner and outer boundaries a linear map which satisfies a set of properties. Okay. So you see how so you see what's happening here. Let's let's go through this slowly because it's it's good to uh, get this right. When we want to define an n-dimensional TQFT, the information that we start off with are n minus one manifolds that uh, 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 the n minus one uh, n minus one dimensional manifolds that form the inner and outer boundaries. Okay, to each of, or to all of these guys, I will associate a vector space right, to the to the inner and outer boundaries. I will uh, not inner and outer, uh, ingoing and out, uh, incoming and outgoing boundaries. I will associate a vector space, and to the manifold in between, the cobordism in between, right? That fills in this space. I'm going to treat that as a linear map between this vector space and this vector space, such that it satisfies a set of properties that I would like it to. Okay. Is it clear? Uh, is what I'm saying clear? I, I'm starting. I, I just I'm essentially assigning to n minus one manifolds uh, to all n minus one manifolds in the game uh, a vector space, and then I am associating to the n manifolds such that the boundary of the n manifold is the n minus one manifold that I started out with. I'm associating to that a linear map. Uh, uh, just a quick question. It's a bit confusing with the notation z being used for both the vector space and the map. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, this I, I I was I was using a reference, and that's how they did it there. Uh, but uh, I I I will let's let's go through the properties one by one, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I hope it will become clear. Okay. So the first first requirement is equivalent cobordisms have identical images. What does this mean? This means that if I so the, remember M is the n manifold in between. Let's let's forget n, okay? Let's just deal with uh, you know d equals uh, you know uh, d equals two, say, okay? So I want a two-dimensional TQFT, okay? My bound. So what I do is for a two-dimensional TQFT, it's a function that assigns to every closed-oriented one-manifold, which are my boundaries. I assign to all my boundaries. My boundaries can only be circles, so I'll assign to those circles some vector spaces. And all the ways of joining these circles together, I will associate these maps, or linear maps. Okay. So the first requirement: equivalent cobordisms, which are cobordisms that are, are diffeomorphic to each other. I mean, uh, three manifolds uh, that are diffeomorphic to each other that fill in this space. Sorry, three manifolds. What am I? I'm working. Two manifolds. Two manifolds. Two manifolds that are like diffeomorphic to each other. They have identical images. Images under what? Images under this. This. This guy over here, which means the transition from your initial state to your final state, your initial vector space to your final vector space, does not care about, uh, you know, uh, uh, does not distinguish between equivalent cobordisms. Okay. The second axiom is the cylinder sigma cross i. Okay, I can think of it as like some like this, something like that is mapped to the identity map on sigma, where sig sigma is basically like the, the, the n minus one manifold, the, the, the boundary. Right? So the cylinder is mapped to the identity. When I say identity, I mean identity on the vector space associated to the uh, this thing. 
Now you might think, for example, that wait, hold on one second. In quantum mechanics, we study Hilbert spaces. Uh, here you're saying you only need a vector space, right? Hilbert space has more structure, okay? but these are the axioms. It turns out to be kind of useful to define things this way, and it will be applicable to the physics context as well. Okay. The third axiom is one that we already saw, uh, the axiom of composition. Okay. So if I have two, two uh, manifolds M and N, and uh, they are sort of joined together by a common boundary, then the map that takes me from uh, uh, like the beginning, the beginning, uh, the, the incoming boundary of M to the outgoing boundary of N is the composition of the maps that take me halfway and then all the way there. Okay. Finally, uh, like yeah. Finally, disjoint unions map to tensor products. So if I have boundaries that are made up of disconnected pieces, right? Then the corresponding vector spaces are just treated as tensor product vector spaces. So if I have, let's say a boundary with one circle, and now I consider a different situation where I have boundary with two circles, right? Then I have a vector space associated to this circle and this circle, and the, my, the vector space associated to this boundary is just the tensor product of the vector spaces associated to both of these guys. So uh, yeah, about this, uh, would that mean that uh, the vector space we assign to a certain n minus one uh, di di dimensional space mm. is a function of just the sorry, did Aditya freeze for anyone else? Yeah, yeah, he's frozen for me as well. Uh, um... I also have a question. So, so, so if, is he back? No, oh, no, yeah, he's back. He's back. Aditya, sorry, we couldn't hear so you. You lost he's my back. voice for a while? Yeah. Yeah, so what, what I was saying was that the vector space that you assign to a certain n minus one dimensional boundary that you have. Right. Is, is it just a function of what the shape of that n minus one dimensional boundary is and that the vector space would be the same wherever that shape will occur? So as, as a specific example, mm. let's say I have a circle at two ends, just right. a one, one, one dimensional space. And I have some strange two, 2D space that kind of stretches between this to that. Right. Uh, are you saying that by virtue of the fact that I have a circle at this end and a circle at that, that end, the vector space assigned to these two spaces is the same. Um, because I am I want to make sense of four here, right. right? So you're saying that if sigma has that kind of a structure, right. then Z of sigma is like Z of that space into Z of that space. Right. Which seems to tell me that that I should have a sense of what Z of sigma prime is and what Z of sigma double prime is, right. even though they don't occur in isolation by themselves. Uh -huh. Okay, I understand. You, I understand you, you, you see what I'm saying. So the yeah. thing is, your that does it mean that depending upon the geometry or just the topology of the n minus one dimensional space that you have mm. that that it is always going to have the same vector space wherever it appears elsewhere i don't think so i'm saying i don't i don't think so but um to be honest i i had not thought about this uh so like uh, i think maybe it's best if i like look it up and, and get back to you right so i'm just thinking how would one like how how would one make use of this? So let's say if 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 I had two two circles, right? You are saying that I'll have it'll have the structure of v times v. Yes, but it's the same v. Same v, yeah. Huh. So so you're saying that the fact that it's a circle means that it is always going to be Some the z v. of Z right, of S1 right. is going to always be V, the same V. Let's like, say you yeah, pick yeah. some V at some the start. V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Z of S1 is going to be V no matter yeah. where S1 up, 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 up appears. I think, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that, I mean, so in examples I've seen like, at least, yeah, that's how it works. 
So if if I go from let's say two circles to three, right. I'm going from v times v to v times v times v. That's right. Yes. I it's think. not as if I can as assign this as v one times v two, and then this will be like some v three times v four times v five. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be. Yeah, v I I think that you would have you would run everywhere. Into... I have s one. Right. I think that you wouldn't you run into problems because. Um... Uh, well, that is why, uh, like, otherwise, I don't see how statement four makes sense because sigma pr prime right. and sigma prime prime don't ap appear on their own. Right. To start with, we should not ex expect that. Okay. Right. right. Really that, that kind of didn't he take when when, when he defined the linear map? That was make, making the map from z to z. Right. It's the same vector space, just the. Base uh, sigma is probably defined. Well, Z M was sigma Z of sigma zero to Z of sigma one, right? Right. So right. Kind but of he's now the... saying that let's say if I'm just studying the in state and if the in state has is made of various parts, hmm. yeah. Okay, then the vector space that is assigned to this in state as like right. like, like the in boundary yeah. is going to have this. Product structure, right. right, right, which means that to each object, each sub part of that, he's assigning a vector space, right. Which so now here is the thing. So are you assigning the vector space based on the shape, wherever that shape may occur elsewhere, or do you assign it? You so know that can be result like a couple of sigma zero. You know, from the linear map definition, which is ZM, which goes from Z sigma zero to Z sigma one. Suppose your sigma zero you take as sigma prime union sigma double prime, and your sigma one you take as sigma prime union sigma double prime union sigma triple prime. So it's like the same vector space inside the argument I'm saying. That is how it would I thought yeah about. I I think that I think that uh, if 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 you see a circle then you associate to it some vector space B I mean, and it's I, the same space I, no matter think, where the yeah so I mean so, that's so. that's I think that's the version that I have seen uh, there may be some refinements possible no that 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 might make sense yeah that that makes sense actually yeah so so, so Madhu, yeah. I have a question probably that's vaguely connected to what uh, Aditya mm -hmm. is asking. So uh, let's say the initially you have Z sigma to that sigma prime map, but not this one, the initial picture that you have shown. So how do you calculate what is the Z of sigma, dimension of Z of sigma, that vector space? Does it be corrected to the homology uh, group or something? Probably that would That's answer how this. you specify what Z is. Like to, to, to specify Z is to specify this rule. No, yeah. but I'm asking the dimension of the vector space. No, that the also dimension. is no, that all also is part of you know the assignment. No, but that's that's uh, that's how that's what I was thinking. That whether that dimension of vector space has something to do with the homology group or something. Then no, that no, would no, make, no, no. Uh, that would no. make your answer. It's clear. just it's just the assignment of a vector space, a finite dimensional vector space, to uh, this boundary. So, for given a problem, given a given a field theory, how do I know what's the dimension of the vector space? No, this is so. This is so because I'm pursuing it in a sort of axiomatic fashion. This is a construction of a TQFT. I'm giving you the principle, basic mathematical principles required to construct an object that behaves like a TQFT. Uh, okay, okay, okay. It's not, we are not starting with a physical theory and then trying to break it. What we're doing is we're saying that what are the basic principles or ideas that a TQFT uh, essentially features? But that, then that's, that's what I was asking. Let's say when you say the boundary is sigma, yeah. and then we're assigning a vector space on that sigma. Yes. Uh, Z sigma, that's what you're you calling. Yeah. Then uh, how do you make sense of this vector space? Like what uh, you, you you only have. To, uh, it's it's uh, a it's a natural analog of the definition of uh, you know the Hilbert space of a of a of a theory at a particular time. Right. Hmm. Is it not like the boundary structure for uh, forming a vector space? That's what you mean. Right? Sorry. It's thought of that the boundary states are forming a vector. That's what we mean. Yeah, yeah. That, no, so, that, that, so let's say, let's say your boundary is S1. Okay. Then, what is, uh, then, then you have a vector space on that S1, right? I but associate, that, a, yeah, I associate some vector I space. Associate some vector space on S1. So that should have some dimension, the vector space. If you, when you're saying finite dimensional. It is, so, yeah, so, you yeah. can so, call it N. It's some dimension. Huh? Let's say some dimension N. So, so your linear map, let's say you have the cylinder state. 
Okay, right. the cylinder is coming from S1 to its mapping, uh, I mean, the, the, both the boundaries are let's say S1. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so here one, uh, you have said this uh, two, uh, I mean, the your axiom two. Mm -hmm. So axiom two is basically saying that uh, in both the cases, the dimension also have to be same. Is it true or is it not? That's what I'm asking. Let's say you have two boundary, uh, two vector spaces on the two boundaries, right? On the cylinder. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now it is the it same space. It is it the is same space because this is the, the identity space. map on B, right? Yeah. So right. It, so by by consider by this uh, your axiom two, it have to be the same dimensional space as well. The vector space have to be have the same ah, dimension. Okay. Yeah, I think what Aditya is asking is if I have like. Uh, Yes, you, know, you have let's say two different. So S1 cross S1 kind of, I mean, two right, S1s right. in the beginning and then you have one S1 at the, yeah. I mean, the outside. Then right. uh, what does it say? Your Z sigma, does it have to be like the total uh, dimension have to be same in both the sides? I mean, initially, if you uh, just say that you have S1 and S1, two S1s initially, yeah. and then uh, then you have another S1 uh, right. at the boundary, right. two sides. Two to one. So, yes. yeah. Right. So if you have the vector space here is, let's say, M, uh, dimension is M, and then this one is M1 and M2, let's say, who knows, <laughs> M1 and M2. Then your Z sigma full dimension would be your, uh, um, uh, your uh, some, some dimension, you know, because this is M. This M1 M2. times M2. Right. And then it, you have, uh, let's say, at the boundary, uh, at the other boundary, right. it has some dimension N. Right. So does it also have to be M1, M2 have to be equal to N or something like that? No, no. because, no, no. no. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, no, go on. Uh, I was yeah, just so going to say in that. The example that in, in the specific example that you said, hmm. based on what we were speaking about, this fourth one, you are right. now studying a map from V times hmm. V to V. Right, yes. Hmm. So, so that whole shape is just a way of saying that I'm studying a map from V times V to V. No constraint or dimension or anything. No. V times because v I can v. I can have I can have a map from v times it's v the to same v, right? v though it's the same right v, v times v to v I think oh, v times so, v to v yeah yeah uh, yeah, so, yeah it's, it's it's yeah it's just v tensor v to v is what this guy looks right. like right okay 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 now I'm getting it. there's v times v to v okay mm. Okay, I, I will we'll look at some examples. So, so the, yes, the, yes. The, the final, the final, uh, um, this thing is that an empty uh, n minus one manifold. Uh, I, I'll, I'll show you explicitly what this looks like. Is is just mapped is just uh, associated to complex numbers. Okay. Now the reason that these ax the axioms look kind of like uh, strange, but the reason this is um, what we think of as a TQFT is because it does not feel the difference between equivalent cobordisms. So I can have equivalent cobordisms, and the this this construction does not care about you know which representative you choose. Equivalent uh, cobordisms are not distinguished. Uh, I just uh, wanted to give uh, this thing. So how much more uh, time would you need? Uh, so I was just going to uh, do two examples, uh, okay. and just end with uh, mentioning Frobenius algebras. So, like, so I think so, so, maybe roughly. maybe five minutes more if you guys don't ah, interrupt sure. me. Sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry for running late again. Somehow I seem to. Have, um, so so let me just run through this stuff quickly, and then whoever wants to hang out can hang out. Right. So this is the TQFT because it is not. Uh, it does not feel the difference between equivalent cobordisms. Right. That's essentially uh, when I say equivalent cobordisms. Remember that what I mean is I have um, an n manifold uh, which which uh, which shares the same n minus one boundaries. Right. And uh, that n manifold. Uh, basically, any two n manifolds that are diffeomorphic to each other uh, count as uh, an equivalent cobordism. So, uh, what's interesting is that for a closed n manifold, okay, ZM is just a number, and 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 so TQFTs give us invariants of n manifolds. Okay, so so the, I just want to so point out that you know just with the cylinder, just this axiom two, um, I can look at this in kind of different ways. The first way is to think of it as, uh, uh, so I'm going to think of these guys as the boundaries, okay? These guys as the boundaries. The first way is just to think of the cobordism as going from uh, this guy over here to this guy over here, okay? And this is uh, where, like we saw from uh, axiom two, this is just the identity on the vector spaces associated to these boundaries. But I can take the same shape and I can draw it like this. 
So you see what's happening here is my initial vector space is these two guys, and my final vector space is just a point, like empty. So what that what that essentially means is that I'm 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 looking at um, uh, a vector space and its dual being mapped to C. Okay, and uh, I, I can turn this guy around, and what that's going to uh, what that's going to give me is that's going to give me a complex number being mapped to the tensor product of a vector space and its dual. Okay. So, so it's it's really just you know playing around with these with these pictures. So let's just look at a specific example, okay? And uh, so this is just a question the, the 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 case of one dimensional TQFTs. This is a very simple example. We can work it out in one page. Now, one dimensional TQFTs. If you want to construct, we have to start with uh, n minus one dimensional uh, objects, which are just points in this case, okay? But we want a sense of orientation. We want a sense of incoming or outgoing. So we, 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 we say we have points with positive and negative orientations, plus and minus, okay? Now a zero manifold sigma is just a collection of disjoint points, right? Which is the, the boundary. boundary. Boundaries here are just collections of disjoint points uh, with uh, a positively oriented part and a negatively oriented part, which means a collection of plus points and a collection of minus points. And uh, these, uh, these uh, sigma plus and sigma minus are associated to Z of sigma plus and Z of sigma minus, which are dual vector spaces. Okay, one can prove that this is the case. Now, every now, now what we have to do is you have to fill in the space between these guys, right? So every non-empty one manifold is just a collection of lines and or circles. Okay. So if let's let's say V is just the Z of uh, PT plus, okay, then uh, if I have uh, two, two plus lines, uh, two pluses and a line joining them, that's just the identity on V. If I have two minus signs and a line joining them, that's just the identity on V dual. Okay. If I have a plus and a minus that just curl up like this, then that essentially corresponds to uh, V tensor V star uh, to C. Okay. And sorry, excuse me. This yeah. uh... Plus and minus is some kind of extra embellishment you didn't have so far, right? I mean, yeah. So plus and minus are really just uh, the the way of thinking about the incoming and outgoing boundaries. Really, because you have like plus plus on on the two sides. So, so which one would you say is the in state and which one is the out state? I mean, it really feels like there is a, this is something extra, right? Because like you have a line that is that that is from plus to Plus, so uh -huh. so is that really then an inner or, or an out thing? Yeah, because 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 the the thing is that with a line like this, because it's just identity, I can collapse this line, right? Oh, but that no, that is that is fine. But uh, you still have have a sense of something being an in state and something being an out state. That statement you just said is also true for sigma times interval, right? No, I, I mean. Sigma could be of any dimension, mm -hmm. uh, but you still have, have a sense that uh, sigma that at, at one end is an in state and at one end is the out state. Right. So is this um, like some extra embellishment, the sign uh, on top of everything else? Isn't um, there the size of mod function here? Sorry? Isn't there some choice of more? Morse function D that you defined earlier. Choice of Morse function. I mean, inherently, when you say the, there the is some length function. of the line, the length of, of the line is a good um, Morse. Morse function to have. The length of the line, as as measured from the left hand side, how far you have gone in. Just measure the length where you are, and that is a good enough Morse function on this space. Uh, with regard to what Aditya was saying about this extra uh, right. feature about this plus or minus, I think I, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I understood was that if you instead had like a circle to circle, the circle you you have the same. You know, uh, I mean, from let's say like. The whatever, right. right hand thumb root, you have two orientations. Right. Uh, so naively for a point, there shouldn't be uh, any such orientation. 
So you're artificially adding something extra by giving the same number of uh, orientations as a one dimensional. Uh, no, but I think, I no, think in, that, in, in, interval no, has me... a sense of like left and right, right? And a, interval does have a sense of left and right. So if you have an interval from zero to one, mm -hmm. and if your arrows just go, you know, leftward or mm -hmm. rightwards, mm -hmm. then 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 you think of the zero as an in, like, you know, where the arrow comes in and one is where the arrow goes out. Right, right. But I mean, from the perspective of the point, the orientation seems outside the manifold, right? But I mean, if you have a circle, the same arrow on the circle, uh, uh, I mean, sort of like, I mean, you could have a clockwise arrow or an anti-clockwise arrow. No, is... Okay, let's not, let's not draw arrows on circles. One second. So I, 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 I think that Aditya may be right, that like, really what I'm, I'm talking about is, with the plus and minus, what that buys me is that buys me the ability to talk about a vector space and its dual. So I think that's what's happening over here. Sorry, I, I, I did not appreciate this. Uh, if I let's say, for example, I just had I didn't have plus or minus. Okay, then uh, all of these these indications are going to go away, right? And and I, I'm not I'm not going to have a sense in which like there is a V star, right? So my guess is that the plus minus is really just to get that uh, vector space and its dual kind of stuff going on. Yeah, I, I also I think it's a, it's an additional thing. I mean, I, I don't know if it comes comes with it, right? That I thought that was the point. Uh, maybe, maybe I, I'll I'll check. I'm sorry about this. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, now, uh, yeah, I have I have uh, you know plus to plus, minus to minus. Plus to minus, uh, uh, plus and minus going to uh, going to nothing, and nothing going to minus and plus, right? And the thing about nothing going to minus and plus is like it's just a map from C to V tensor V star, right? Uh, which is which is really just a, an endomorphism of V, which essentially sends uh, any complex number lambda to lambda times the identity element acting on V. Okay, and uh, one of the things that you can show is that uh, uh, you you can also have you know just nothing going to nothing, right? Which is just breaking up the circle into two pieces that look like this, okay? And then I use these two rules, and that's just the composition of like uh, EV and uh, co EV, which just gives me the trace of this thing, which gives me the dimension, okay? So, so what, what's happening here is that the Z itself is completely defined by the vector space in, in the case of one dimensional TQFTs. Okay. But is it, is it essentially the same thing if you join plus with minus since uh, I'm, uh, that when you break it up? Oh, um, well, you, um, you can't so so I I'm thinking of plus and minuses as corresponding to a kind of cap in the in the geometry right like okay. so this sort of thing. The reason I'm the reason I'm splitting it like this is because this is just identity right. Right 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 I guess like inserting yes. identity over here and over here. Okay perfect. Okay. Now in the case of in the case of uh, two two dimensional TQFTs the of course the only closed one manifold is a circle. Right, and so an arbitrary cobordism uh, between any, uh, uh, let's say, R, R circles on one side and S circles on the other is just the gluing together of these guys with all possible plumbing fixtures. Okay, so you have these caps, you have a pair of pants, you have uh, these identities, right? Uh, so you could have, for example, something that looks like this. And um, uh, what what one can do is one can really think of these. Uh, 2D TQFTs, you can associate a vector space A to the circle, say, and uh, uh, you associate linear maps to all of these generators, okay, because all of these generators take you from one set of circles to another set of circles. So, for example, the pair of pants is going to be a map from A times A to A, okay, and what I can do is I can think of this as multiplication. Now, what now at this point, what Aditya would tell you at some point is that I can I can consider the the opposite or oppositely oriented pair of pants. I can look at the guy that looks like this, right? And I can think of this also. This is a kind of co-multiplication. Okay. Now, any the, the the point is that 
any two connected compact oriented surfaces are diffeomorphic if they have the same genus and the same number of incoming and outgoing surface. So what that means is there are a lot of identities that you can construct simply by playing around with your uh, set of uh, set of plumbing fixtures, right? Just by you know capping something, collapsing it, uh, moving things around. These are kind of uh, fun things to imagine uh, occasionally. Uh, and uh, this is really the sort of starting point for uh, investigations in relation to uh, the things like Frobenius algebras, which uh, Aditya said he will talk about at some point. Okay. You can, uh, of course, one question. Yeah. Uh, so, regarding this fact that you stated, they need to connect a compact oriented surface. Right. So, suppose uh, you take the comp uh, example of that uh, 4.1 genus amplitude, which told us with four functions that you showed okay. earlier. So, now I know that uh, there are diffeomorphisms which take the torus to a torus. Right. There are like uh, modular directions also which take you from one torus to an equal torus. There are what? Uh, Sorry. Uh, so uh, along the modular directions, if you change, um. then a torus goes to an inequivalent torus, right? Means a torus to, to by which you cannot reach by just a diffeomorphism. Right. So then they will give different cobordism, right? Um, you are not able to reach to a uh, to the same manifold by a simply a diffeomorphism. Yeah, but what's happening there is you're you're essentially the 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 object that you are uh, dependent on is the complex structure. Okay. Right. So nowhere did we say that a TQFT cannot depend on the complex structure. In fact, like there are TQFTs in, in two dimensions that sort of uh, that are sensitive to the complex structure of the manifold. So, uh, uh, can, uh, sorry, just to uh, Madhu, if you're finished, we can uh, 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 continue. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't have anything else. I uh, just, this is the sort of um, vague idea I wanted to do. So. Okay, okay. I think then, I think it's a, a good space to, uh, good time to thank Madhu, uh, and uh, people who are interested can uh, stay back uh, and discuss. Uh, uh, so with that, uh, uh, I'll end the recording. Thank you, Madhu. Cool.